Okay, so um, the talk is introducing Hype 4.0. Uh, for those of you who didn't get the memo, I am Jonathan Deutsch. Um, so I'm the founder and head developer of Tumult. And so I want to talk about the next version. Um, but I was thinking about what happened last year, and the talk I gave was on the evolution of Hype and really the um, evolu how Hype goes from thoughts and ideas and feedback into an actual new version, into a product. And so while that talk last year was all about process, this talk is going to be about the fruits of the process. So most of this is just going to be a demo of what's new. Um, but a lot has happened in the last year, so I thought maybe we could start by recapping um, some of what did happen. Uh, so there have been lots of new creations. Um, we've seen a lot today that's been pretty amazing. Um, in fact, just during this conference, I got a message from Daniel um, with a document that he says is wonderful and I should show it. I have not seen this before, so who knows what it actually will even contain, but um, I just wanted to show off something he said was great and evidently um, it is, did you say an animated history of Denmark? Okay, so this is a uh, creation. <laughs> is, I don't know if there is audio or, yeah, this is in video form. Yeah, it looks like I guess it was interactive on the site, so. Um, Okay, so those are all click areas. So, yeah, we can, we can fast forward through the. <laughs> Okay, so lots of new great creations, um, both that and what you guys have created. Uh, there is a new resource that I wanted to talk about, and that was something Liz mentioned, which is Tour to Hype, which is new and available. And Tour to Hype um, is created by a couple guys in Germany, so that's not um, really done by us, but we've helped support the site. And this is a new place where there's a lot of learning materials that you can see. So they have right now, I think five, like, yeah, six different tutorials. And each of them um, have not only information on um, how they created it, but they have videos explaining it step by step and also documents to download. And the tutorials that they have right now actually are great at running the gamut from being great beginner tutorials if you're just getting started to being more advanced tutorials that even cover code integration. Um, so here's one that they did. This is a ski jump game. And so this is done in Hype, but with a little bit of code. Um, and it even makes use of some advanced Hype features. Like I think this uses relative timelines. And so at some point I think I can say jump. And depending on when I clicked, I'll either do really well. I think if I jump at like the wrong time, he'll like fall. Maybe that one was okay. Maybe it's insane. Um, but basically they put all that information online. So this is a great resource. And the videos that they've done are extremely high production value as well. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, yeah, the guys who did this also have put on some workshops. So they recently put one on in San Francisco. Um, and so they talked about a wide variety of topics. I don't think it was recorded, unfortunately. But I think they're trying to put on more and more workshops. They're arranging some in Europe. Maybe there will be some more in the US. Um, so that's also something that's come about in the last year. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, something is a WordPress plugin to help integrate Hype documents into WordPress pages. This was originally a complete third-party endeavor done by someone else. Um, I think there were some compatibility issues either with WordPress or yeah, I guess it was a WordPress issue. And he um, was nowhere to be found, unfortunately. We've tried contacting him to see if he wanted to update it. and. Um, we don't know what happened to the guy, unfortunately, so we've just decided to take over uh, the WordPress plugin um, because it's pretty vital to the community. 
So I just want to show off how easy it is with this plugin to integrate um, hype documents. So let me go, I will grab hype document that I want to integrate. And so in hype to get the um, document, and this is just a document covering um, C levels over time, it's responsive. Um, to put it into the um, WordPress page, you actually export it as an OAM widget. Um, just the original developer found that was something that was already packaged and easy to digest, and that makes sense. Maybe we'll do an export script that will change things up, but right now you just say an OAM widget. Um, I'll just put this in my temp folder for now. And then on a WordPress blog, I just wanna show how easy this was. Um, you can say add a new post. Um, so we'll say Lake Mead, not Leak Maid, Lake Mead. Uh, you can just click this Hype Animation button. So once the plugin's been installed, you just say Hype Animations. Um, if you click here, you can navigate to the file. I guess I have an exported one right there too. And then with a pretty simple syntax, um, you just say the hype animation, there's an ID, and you preview. Um, it shows up in the document. So it's that easy to get a hype animation, um, a responsive hype animation in a WordPress page. So that is right now, um, we're dealing with the WordPress um, approval process. So it's not available in like its public final form right now, but I think, do you have the latest version on the forums? Yeah, so on the forums, if you search WordPress plugin, there's a pretty recent thread that has this, so you can download and be a beta tester for the WordPress plugin if you have a WordPress site, and it should be coming pretty soon once WordPress approves everything. And then also this year was Hype 3.6, which was released. Um, and so the funny thing about Hype 3.6 is it was a, a pretty big release, and we weren't really planning to do a 3.6. So actually about 3.6 had a ton of bug fixes and then a few features that were mainly targeted towards the ad industry. And so Hype 3.6 is really like half of Hype 4.0, just targeted as 3.6. Um, so 3.6 has a lot of bug fixes, so nearly all the bug fixes you would think would go into 4.0 uh, you already have in Hype 3.6. Um, and there were a few other features as well. Um, so in Hype 3.6, if you import a video, um, let me just do that. So there's a few extra video options that are highly requested issues, one of which is you can inline a video on iOS. So previously, if you had a iPhone, whenever there was a video, even if it played, it would just take up the full screen. Now with the inline option, you can actually play that video within um, your web view and it won't take up the full screen. Um, and you can also autoplay video on iOS now, which is a really highly requested feature. Uh, the one caveat is Apple won't allow autoplay unless the video is muted, because they really don't want audio to drive people nuts. Um, but so you can autoplay video, um, and that was like one of our top requested features, and that was really a browser limitation imposed on Apple, or that Apple imposed on everyone that you couldn't autoplay, but now you can, as long as it's muted. Um, and then one of the big features of um, Hype 3.6 is the notion of export scripts, and this is a way to extend Hype, um, generally to have your export work in a workflow such as going to an ad system. And so I just wanted to show um, that right now really quick. So export scripts themselves, anyone can develop. So if you have your own custom system, whether it's like a learning content management system, an ad system, or you just wanna do something at the end, like maybe do an FTP upload or a WordPress upload, you could develop that yourself. We've developed a few export scripts, um, some of which are for dealing with ad systems, such as DoubleClick Studio or DoubleClick Campaign Manager and Seismic. Um, so I have a DoubleClick Campaign Manager um, export script. And so, let me 
Okay, so here we have um, an ad, and I just want to go over what an export script can provide and how you can potentially work with it. Um, so the biggest thing about an export script is that you get an option in the export as HTML5 menu. Um, in this case, I installed the DoubleClick Campaign Manager script. So from right there, you can just say export, and it will actually export as a zip file and package up everything necessary for the ad. Um, the export script can also provide other features, such as extending the hype interface. So in ad, um, in the ad world, you have something called a click tag, which I think the name just came from like the flash days. Um, but the idea is a click tag is something you click on that ultimately is what they call an exit or a URL that you go to when going to the end of the ad. And so often this is defined up front in an ad as far as where it will go to. So if I was making an ad, I would say the click tag URL is like tumult.com if this were to be an advertisement for tumult. Um, and then at a later point when it shows, let's say, the learn more button, that's where you would want to do the exit. And so right here on mouse click, um, the export script itself can define functions to run. And so this is something new in the menu that was provided by the script itself, which is the exit. Export scripts also provide the possibility to preview using that export script. So if it does certain things to the output, um, you can preview that every time you want to see what happened. So that's export scripts. There are four specific workflows. They're not for everyone, but I did want to like lay it out there that there's this cool bit of functionality. I think for people who do, yeah, ads, it saves a lot of time in the workflow. Um, and then I think there's a lot of other neat possibilities that could be done with export scripts, like uploading potentially to GitHub pages could be done with an export script. Oh, there is one other thing I wanted to mention in 3.6. Um, so here we have a nice little demo I'm presenting on a screen. No one can read that code at all. So Hype 3.6 actually has the ability to change the source code editor font um, and size. So if you are displaying for a presentation or um, you have varying eyesight or just don't like the size or font, you can change that. So that was another like hype 3.6, like a small little feature that was worked in. How do you access that again? Uh, that's just in the preferences. Oh, it's in preferences. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's in the uh, general preferences. So yeah, so that's an update on what has happened in the last year. Um, but really what we're going to do is we want to talk about what's new in Hype 4.0. Um, so I had eight features that I wanted to demonstrate to you, and I just thought I would kind of run through them, give you the demo, and um, you know, at the end we can do a Q&A and you can ask me more about it. Uh, so the first feature, um, actually as a background, um, there's a little bit of a theme to this update and that's improving creative capabilities of the app itself. Um, and some of these are the most requested features we've had from users. Some of them are things that browsers now let us do, either because a browser has a new capability or this browser um, adoption has risen to the point where we feel it's like a good enough state to put into hype. Um, and others are just like workflow improvements as well. So the first feature I wanted to cover is the notion of paging to different scenes. Um, so if you've used Hype before, some of these might be like, oh, Hype didn't have that. If you have, sorry, if you haven't used Hype, you might be surprised. You have used Hype, um, hopefully these will be features where you say, oh, finally, you know, they added that. Um, so let's open up Hype 4.0. I can show off this feature. Okay, so if you used Hype previously, um, you would know in the scene inspector, you can go from scene to scene via a swipe action. So in the scene inspector, um, you could say on swiping to the left, jump to a specific scene. Um, and I'll demonstrate what it was before really quick. Um, so before you would actually need to do a swipe and it's disconnected from the action. The new feature is as a transition, instead of saying push right to left, you can say page turn. 
And so now with this on an iPad iOS device or even on a Mac with a mouse where it makes a little less sense, it will actually follow the mouse and then complete the page turn. So it's kind of like iBooks, you should get that smooth transition. It's not do a gesture and then the page turns. Let me show it on this scene. Um, so this scene already has it set up. Actually, let me do a, I'll need to add one more to get to this scene. So you just say jump to scene, it's in the transition. It's only in the transition for swiping. So the interesting thing is the animations play as you swipe. Um, so that's basically how that works. And then the next scene will start when the swipe is complete. So not only can you swipe to the left and right, but you can also swipe um, from the top to the bottom as well and follow. Um, and so that's just done with swiping down or swiping up, the actions are right there. And so that's the new page to scene feature. The next thing I'd like to cover is drop shadows. And I have, I have demos for like all of these, so you'll have to bear with me for a second while um, I set everything up. So I'll import an image right here, uh, make it a little bit smaller. So I'll make sure everyone can see okay. And so in the past, uh, the only shadow height provided was a box shadow where you would take the basic shape of the element, which was generally always rectangular, and if you added a shadow to that, you would get an effect like this, which maybe is what you want in some cases, especially if the image has um, no transparency at all. But in this case, in the image, you actually want the shadow to be behind the flowers. And so by clicking the drop shadow type, um, now for anywhere in alpha, it will kind of create a mask on the fly and make a shadow out of that. So that has to be a PNG, right? Uh, no, it can be pretty much anything. You can do it with that, a JPEG because there's no alpha. Yeah, you can't do it with a JPEG because there's no alpha um, in a JPEG. But let's say you were to do something like um, had an oval and a rectangle. So in the past, uh, let's say we made a group out of this. And if we do the box shadow on the group, it would look like this. But we can do a drop shadow on the group and it will appear like that, and so as you move around, the drop shadow will form in the right place. And so drop shadow is actually always a CSS property, but it wasn't well supported by different browsers, um, and now we think the penetration is pretty good and will look correct. Um, it won't work on older versions of IE. It's the big one. The fun thing, of course, about how it works um, is if you have something like a hole, in, oops, I need to change the drop shadow first. Um, it'll even work with holes, so like a donut hole, you can get that. So it's pretty flexible and usually, I think is what most people actually will want instead of a box shadow most of the time. So that's feature number two. Feature number three is skew. Okay, so let's say we have um, a little box that we want to present Right here, um, skewing is a transformation that you can do to graphics where you can basically, honestly the best word for it is skew the graphic. <laughs> um, so you can skew in any direction that you want, um, X or Y. Um, in this case I had actually done something. By default the transform origin is in the center. Um, so by default your skews are going to look like this. Um, but in this case, maybe we want the box to be planted. So what we would do is if you hold down command, you can move the transform origin to the um, bottom. And now because it will skew from that point. So skewing can be like a little bit of a weird effect. You may be looking at this and be like, well, you know, that's fun, but maybe that's not actually going to be the most useful thing. And to that, let me actually give a demo of how I think it is, in fact, a very useful transformation for animations and can add quite a bit. 
So let's say we have this box, um, and the box can move in space and time. Um, and if we were to like want it to move, we can have it keep moving, but there happens to be this little box on the ground. Honestly, I have, I, it, it's something that's going to stop the box. So we want to um, move this over time. So what we can do is a simple animation. Um, so we'll hit record. And quite simply move the box until it hits um, the little black barrier that we have. Um, so if we look at this animation, first of all, there's a few things that we're not going to like about it. Um, it's doing an ease in and ease out. If it were to be accelerating and hit something, it wouldn't ease like that. So the very first thing that we'll just do on this animation, just to make it look right, is have it ease in, um, but then it'll kind of come to a more abrupt stop, like so. Um, in fact, I'm not even super satisfied with that because it doesn't feel like it's picking up quite enough speed. So I'm just going to change the curve just a little bit and this way it'll start out a little bit slower, gain speed, and then come to a, a quicker stop, like so. Um, hopefully that's playing all right. I think it plays a little bit faster frame rate in the browser. So now that's looking pretty good, and that might be an effect that you want. But using skew, I think we can add a little bit more weight um, and animation capabilities to this. So as the box moves forward um, with a lot of objects, you might have the top of it kind of move back based on the acceleration. So what we can also do is record and perhaps record a skew for this um, going back like so. So we can do, let's say, 10 degrees. I think that looks pretty good. Um, and what we'll want is we'll want this timing function also to be the same. So I'll just save that one off so we can use it. And so now the skew will match the acceleration, which is um, what we want. And so now you get a result looking like that. Um, clearly the box shouldn't stay in that, so you can see it's, it's starting to have a little bit of weight, but it's hitting um, the end point, and so now we just need something that will kind of bring it forward. And there's a few different techniques to do this. You could do keyframes where it goes forward. What I'm actually going to do is just set it back to zero, and then use a elastic timing function where it'll kind of like overshoot and come back. Um, I think that's easy in this case, but you may not want it in every case. So I will just add um, a keyframe for skew x, um, and I'll set this back to zero when it hits. And so now I can just do, let's say, a um, elastic timing function at that point, and so we can see what this looks like. And so that was not bad. I think if you see it, you can see it kind of hits a little bit, but it's maybe not quite as exaggerated as, as I would like. So the final um, thing that I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, again, do a little bit of a custom modification on the elastic timing function, just have it way overshoot, way hit back. Um, and I think something like that where it's just a little bit more exaggerated will look good. So that's, that's the end result. And so this is one way where, whoops. I think skew can actually add quite a bit to animations and not just be a funky transform that you never use. I, I rarely use it in static documents, but I think in animated documents it can add a lot and transform something from being a plain box to something that's a little bit more wibbly wobbly. And so that's skew. Uh, the next one is math equation timing functions. And so this is a high professional feature and so in the last demo, I showed a bunch of different timing functions on easing and doing elasticity as a way to control the position. Um, you can get more sophisticated than that by controlling whatever curves you want, but sometimes you actually need code. And in fact, there's a website that has really interesting examples of timing functions um, done using trigonomic um, math, like sine and cosine. And so this website has, it's probably a little bit hard to see, let me zoom in. So these have a bunch of different mathematical formulas written on them on how a shape will transform over time. And so in Hype, you can actually enter in these formulas via JavaScript and control an element that way. So let me demo that for you right now. So here I have a button, um, I'm gonna call it do not press me, and maybe I want this to pulsate over time. 
So what I can do is I can make a basic animation of like a start or an end point. Um, I'm just going to adjust the scale here. And where the feature comes into play is in here I can say math equation and I can actually type in code that I want. So I could go to that page and take the code. You need to adapt it a little bit because you can't just say cosine in JavaScript. You have to say like math.cosine. Um, and maybe I can, I think I want to multiply it or something like that. And so you can get all kinds of different timing functions that way. And so now if I preview this, you can see based on the mathematics that I entered, I can actually get a completely different animation. So you can do all kinds of things with math and programming in that regard. So the next one, this is one of our top feature requests, is the ability to import sprite sheets or image sequences. So often you may compose an animation in a different tool. It might be a hand-drawn animation, um, it might be pixel artwork, it might be, um, let's say, a 3D object that you took photos of at 72 different angles that you wanted to import and have be interactive. And so now Hype has a way to get those kinds of animations in very easily um, and play back with Hype's animation system. So I'll just start with a blank document. And the way to get at this, so actually let me show you. So here's a sprite sheet. This is for a pretty popular game. And this is a walk cycle of a character simply walking. And so this is what a typical sprite sheet will look like where all the assets for the animation have been laid out. And so this is, you would not build this sprite sheet in Hype, it would come from um, a different piece of software. And so now in Hype, you can say, you, you can say insert a sprite sheet. Um, and so I will add the image like so. And then it has a sprite sheet editor. And so what you can do is you can define the number of rows and columns that are in the document. So this one has four by seven, and so you, now you can see each frame will align correctly. And in fact, this one has a blank one as the last one, so I can just reduce the frame number and say there's 27 frames here. In fact, some sprite sheets that you'll find off the internet, um, some of the sizing isn't quite right, so in this case, I think I need to move the bottom up, and you, you can see if you look very closely at this, you can see it's actually a bit off, so I think I need to move the bottom by three um, and the top by two. It also will give you an even sprite, sprite number. Um, in this case, 30 frames per second is pretty fast. Um, so I think I'll reduce it down to 15 frames per second. And I can say insert the sprite sheet. And so just like that, now you have, actually I guess 30 frames per second was probably pretty good. But just like that, you have a single element um, and that's running the animation. And in previous versions of Hype, this would have been an extremely laborious and difficult to accomplish task. Um, but it's pretty easy here. So not only can you import a sprite sheet, but you can also import a sequence of images. So here's a little hand-drawn animation um, that has individual frames. And so these are all just it's like 146 different frames. And I can just select them all. Um, and then import them this way as a sprite sheet. This is actually a little bit easier because it knows what the dimensions of each image are, so I don't have to like enter in the rows and columns. Um, just by doing this, it will um, set everything up. And so Hype itself will actually construct the sprite sheet. So here it has each of the individual frames. Um, I think this one, I want to do at 15 frames per second. And so this I can insert into the document. And now I can play back. It's a puppy trying to meditate. Sorry, this was something I like drew a while ago. <laughs> so let me insert another one um, and just show something else off that you can do with this. So this one is the globe. I don't remember. Let me take a look at it to see. 
Okay, so this one is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 by 8, I think. Whoops, 8 by 9. Okay, that looks good. Um, so what I'll do is I'll insert this image. I'm not going to scale it down, I'll just make the document a little bit bigger. I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, so now I have um, a sprite sheet here of a spinning globe. Um, and in this case, uh, the point of this is to actually be interactive. And so you can use a few of Hype's constructs and actually control the spinning of this. So on scene load, um, in this case, I'm just going to um, pause the main timeline because I don't want the globe to start out spinning. And now I can say on drag what I can do is I can actually control um, the timeline for this. And I could either control the regular document main timeline um, or you can control, this is actually just a symbol. Uh, you can dive into it and see what's going on. So I can also control just the symbol's main timeline which is for the globe. And so now when I preview, oops, we get the globe I can actually use my mouse to control how it spins. So if you have a 3D object, let's say maybe a guitar, yeah. um, you can interactively <laughs> yeah, no, control. Can, yeah. This is pretty, pretty awesome. I'll, I'll save my question for the end. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Just curious if it's a symbol, is this in the pro version only? Yeah, this is in the pro version only. Okay. Get the, the guy, and I, I'm not sure if the guy in Iceland or wherever he is is going to be pleased by this or like threatened. This is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that is sprite sheet and image sequence um, importing. The next thing I'd like to talk about is updates to physics. Um, so physics under the hood has used a third party engine called Matter.js. And this version of Hype is making Matter.js accessible um, to anyone using Hype. In the past, because we weren't sure if Matter was necessarily going to be the way forward, we basically like hit it and closed it and so there was no way to access it. Um, but now there is. So here I have a really simple document. Um, it's two balls that are just falling. One is going to fall on a platform, one is not going to fall on the platform. Um, I'm going to make them dynamic physics bodies. And you can see one falls past the platform, the other one hits the platform. And one thing that the Matter API allows you to do is set up constraints between elements. This isn't something that's exposed in Hype's user interface, but you can do in JavaScript. And so I just wanted to give a quick walkthrough on the code to do this. Um, So I'm going to start the balls being static because really what I want is I want this bud to wait until I hit this button just um, for demonstration purposes. It's a little bit easier. And so I've given the balls two IDs. Um, so ball two and ball three is what I'm calling them. And Hype has had a get element property API that lets you kind of extract values from Hype's runtime and Hype's knowledge of a system. One of the new properties you can get is the physics body. And so this is a JavaScript object that the Matter API actually understands. So now we're going from Hype land to the Matter framework land. The other thing we need to get is the actual physics engine that will run uh, the physics. So we have those two items and now using the Matter API we can create a constraint um, and we want to keep one ball always tied in position to the next ball. And so we just create a constraint object we add it to the world, that's how you do it in Matter. Um, and then the final thing we're going to do with the Hype um, Physics API is set the body type to be dynamic, which basically says to the physics animation, okay, go, you're like a real legitimate physics body at this point. And so now when I click the drop bo button, um, it will constrain those two balls and then they'll turn into dynamic bodies and fall. And so you can see what will happen when they're constrained together. So they always must keep a distance, and so they can fall like that 
Um, I'll do that one more time because it's kind of a fun animation. <laughs> it took me a lot of playing to get the positioning just right. That way it would like fall and then kind of move down. Um, that, that's the funnest thing about physics is just playing with it all day long. So if you're using the physics API and you want to debug and figure out what's actually going on between the systems, um, what you can do is there's a variable that we've exposed, which is hype debug physics. And if you just set this to true sometime before the um, script runs, then it will be in a special debug mode where you can get the values out of matter and see what's actually going on in the background. So now you can see it's a black background, which is how matter draws it. And when I click drop, you'll see it shows the connection between the two objects. That's part of like the debugging. And you can see what happens um, right there. And so if you are playing with the physics API, I don't expect everyone to do this, but if you're working on a game, uh, the debug mode is actually a really good way to figure out what, what's happening in, in the physics engine. Do you have to tell that the surface that it falls on, do you have to tell it anything in particular or just any object it'll, it'll connect with it? Uh, so the only thing that you need to do for the surface itself is to set the um, body type to be a static body. So there's three different types. Let me see if I can zoom in. Is that, yeah. Okay, so on physics, you have inactive, which basically means it's not in the world at all, won't interact with everything. Static will interact with bodies, but nothing in the physics world will move it. And then dynamic is all forces are interacting and it will interact. Um, so yeah, in that case, you did need to set the floor to be static. Otherwise, it would, um, it's inactive, it'll everything will just go right through the floor. Okay, the next one also for people who like to do uh, scripting, this should be a really big one, is external resource editing. So here I have a basic document um, that has some resources. It's an animation. There's um, a jellyfish on there. And let's say I'm looking at this document, especially on this display, and I can say, oh, you know, the color is not quite right. It's not what I want it to be. Um, Hype has the behavior where any assets that you bring into Hype it will actually copy into the resource library. So if you had the original asset, you could edit that, um, and you could bring it back into Hype, either automatically, because Hype can detect changes, um, or you can manually drag it in. Sometimes you've lost that initial resource or you don't actually want to edit the other one, you just want to edit the one that's only in hype. Um, so now if you select the resource in the resource library, you can say edit in. And so I could edit this jellyfish in Photoshop. So now we can see we have the jellyfish right here. Let's say we just want to do a color shift on the jellyfish. Uh, maybe I want to make it a purple jellyfish. Um, it's a little more appetizing. I can click OK. And then anytime you save, um, it will be reflected in the hype document. So hopefully you saw, let me undo, and I'll save back, and redo, just hitting the keyboard shortcuts. And when I save, that's actually updated the version within hype. This is useful for images, but images have their own flow. I think the place where this is really useful is for um, JavaScript and the head HTML, um, or if you have other JS files that you brought in. So in here, I could add a JavaScript function. And so um, in the past, you've had to basically use Hype's uh, JavaScript editor, um, which can be confining, especially if you're writing a lot of code. I think that was one area where we didn't see people were going to be writing as much code as they actually do. Um, and so now if you select the element, you can say edit in and edit in a text editor of your choice. So I'll open up BB Edit, because I like BB Edit. And so if I were to um, write some code here, like alert high, and then save it, if I go back into hype, you can see that was added automatically, and so it picked up those changes. 
likewise, I have um, head HTML that has some changes. If I want to do that, the way to do it now, I, I, we're looking for a little bit better of an interface. This is um, not completely finished. You can control click on the edit head HTML button. So this is the pro, pro tip way to do it right now. Um, and you can choose an external editor for the head HTML. And so um, if I want, if I need to change something there, I can do that. And you can see it's picked up in the head HTML. So hopefully this will make workflows a lot better. So that was external resource editing. And the final feature that I want to show is far and away request number one. It's something that's been in Flash for a long time. Um, and I have had a lot of fun making things with it. And that is shapes. <laughs> so let's go into hype, make a new document. So I should have used a mouse, um, so the, my, my artwork's not going to be as good without like a mouse or a pen. Uh, but now to make a shape, you can say um, insert element, and you can simply say vector shape, or you can hit V. And so this will change, let me zoom in a little bit. So now you have a pen tool within height. Um, so you can do this to make basic shapes um, that you would want can close the shape. So very similar if you use Sketch or Illustrator. Um, it's basically the same idea. And now all of a sudden you have a shape. Just like those other tools, uh, these are curve based shapes. So you can drag out four control points. Um, again, just as you would other tools. And these are all shapes in the browser. If I preview, the shape is right there. So these shapes, I, I found in, in doing this feature, I found there's like different keyboard shortcuts and ways to manipulate curves. So I just wanted to walk people through what that is. I guess this can be a on the record way on how to manipulate the shapes. Um, so when we start out, I, I always hit V, like it's hardwired for me to make shapes that way. Um, but when you do a shape, let's say, I'll just um, create something simple to begin with. So when you go in, you can double click in to edit a shape uh, or you can hit V to go out of a shape. So it's similar if you um, have text. Very similarly, you double click in to edit text. Same idea. Double click in to edit. Um, or you can always choose the edit, edit element, like so. Um, if you use motion paths and height, same basic idea. You can select anywhere on a line that will add a point and can drag it out, like so. And so you can have a nice curve that way. For control points, you can manipulate those. By default, um, it's a symmetric control point. If you hold down Option, it's mirrored, um, the two control points. And if you hold down the command, um, then it's asymmetric, um, disjointed. So you can manipulate everything that way. Yeah, I found like all the tools do the keyboard shortcuts and how you choose different things just slightly differently. Um, I think what we've found is similar to Illustrator, but not quite the same as Illustrator. Some of the modes are different, but that's how you manipulate um, the different control points in height. Um, you can, of course, select control points and delete them if you don't like them. Undo things that you would expect that way. So let me make a shape. Um, so I'm going to make a nice diamond shape. And again, you'll have to forgive that this is like really asymmetric. Um, so you can do things like set a, a fill style. So in this case, I'm going to set it to be blue. I can change borders if I want. I don't think I'm going to give this one a border. Um, and one of the great things about this is I can actually go in and let's say there's this diamond, but maybe I'm doing a card game and um, my card, or maybe I'm a magician, and my diamond card has changed into a heart card. Um, so I can simply hit record, move the playhead. Hearts are red, so I'll start with that. Now I can go into the shape. Um, in this case, to make the heart, I'm going to move this control point. Um, I'm going to bring out a couple curves. Oops. 
manipulate that one, manipulate this one. And so now I have a heart. And I did hit the record button, which means when you play the spout, it will do shape morph from a diamond into a heart. Now if you were watching carefully, you would notice that the diamond and the heart had the same number of control points. Uh, you are not limited by that. So let's say I hit record again, and I want to change this. Um, let's say I'll change it into a club. So I'll go into the shape. Clubs are green, right? Okay, I'll go to green. I'll add a couple control points. Oops. And again, I'm, I'm actually like a terrible person um, when it comes to like Bezier shape editing. Like I'm more of a bitmap kind of person. Oops. I'm just gonna, you know, sorry, this is like the most terrible club ever. <laughs> Uh, you get the idea, right? <laughs> okay, so now we've added a bunch of different control points. Um, and I will say sometimes the way it morphs can be interesting, uh, but there you go, from diamond um, to heart to club. So that's shape morphing. Now these shapes interact with hype as any other object would. So let's say you want to do a drop shadow on the object. You can set up that drop shadow. And when we play that back, you can see the drop shadow follows the shape as well. So the feature I showed before works just the same. Skewing um, also works. I, I don't know, my, my love is not skewed, so. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you, you can do anything that you would want with regular um, objects. Uh, one other cool trick that I'd like to show is uh, while editing this, it might be that you want to do, like you want to keep this shape around and make another shape, but you want it to be one of the states. Um, so have a few different shapes this test document. So here we have like the Batman shape, which is pretty cool. Um, so a little trick that you can do is if you copy this element, um, and then let's say we want to record to do a new animation. Um, if you're in the mode and you paste something that was a shape in that mode, um, it will add those frames. Um, in this case, we also want Batman not to be bright green. We'll make Batman. Oh, whoops, that was the stroke color. We'll make Batman. And I'm not recording anymore. I may have just completely ruined the colors. We'll see what happens. Uh, but now you can see Batman will be our uh, final suit. So just like that, you can, you can take an existing shape and bring it in. <laughs> Um, you can also do math equations on these guys if you want. So, um, ah, I won't show math equations. I think you got that one. Let me show something a little bit more fun. Okay, so one of the other ways that this can integrate with height is through the notion of relative timelines. Um, so if you're not familiar with the relative timeline, it's like a regular timeline where you have animations that go from certain states to other states. What makes it relative is the initial state is wherever it's at on the document right now. Um, so it's kind of a complex um, way to do animations, but it means that Hype can understand what state you're at and you don't have like static start and end points. It can be a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more flexible. So here we have um, emoji and it's in the kissy face and I can do a shape morph, um, put it in the angry face that was a little bit of an elastic animation. Um, or I can go to an anguish face. But this is a rel these are all relative animations. So each of these buttons represents a different timeline. So I have a kissy timeline. I have the anguish timeline. The main timeline is uh, the angry one. 
Um, so if I were to go back and let's say I were to click on um, angry, now I can go from anguish to angry, or I can go back to anguish, or I can go from this one to kissy, or I can go from kissy directly to anguish. And so that's all using relative timelines with shape morphing. So there's a new inspector item when you have shapes. Um, this can give you a lot of control and flexibility. Shapes are based off of SVG, so basically SVG path options are available to you. So let's say we have, um, actually let me, let me bring in something else. So let's get some text. I will get an emoji, because emoji are fun. And let's do, the big grin. Okay, there we go. Like this. A bit bigger. And let's say we are doing um, educational content that's showing off um, dentures and teeth. So we may need certain lines to like illustrate concepts. So I can draw that line in height. So I'll simply go from point A to point B. Um, in this case, I don't want a fill at all, so I can remove that fill, and I would like the line to be a little bit longer. So just like that, you have a little bit of a line showing to, um, let's say, that particular tooth. Um, and so there are a few different options that you can play with. Um, so there's different line caps, line join styles, things of that nature. Um, if you look really close when you change the line join, you can see, um, I don't know if you can see that's rounded a little bit, you can change how it joins um, and some of the options therein. And also line caps, you can change. You can see that line cap now is rounded, for example. So you have options like that. Uh, you can also add dashing if you want. So if you want a dashed line, um, you can start out dashing a line like that. Maybe we want something a little bit more like that. In this case, that dashing doesn't really look that good to me, so I'll remove that. Um, But if you were watching closely, one effect that might work really well is um, in the intro animation, I had this hype icon. And when I played it, um, oh, that's the reverse. Well, it was built out. The other one was built in. Just gave away the end of the presentation, by the way. <laughs> um, and so that's a really neat effect. There's a library online called Vivas that's really popular in its way just to do line art effects with SVG. Um, but the technique is actually simple in what it does. It just uses dashing to simulate drawing lines. So if we were to do a dash, let's say, um, that was 100 long and had a gap of 100, you can see that there's the line and then the dash. If I make this 200 and then 200, you can see the line is pretty long and the dash is extending for most of it. You can kind of extend this to the point where the dash part shown is exactly the length of um, the dash part not shown. And then if you just offset that, you'll have the not shown part, and you can animate that offset so it'll like draw the line. It's a little bit of a hack. Um, so the way you need to do it is these numbers are pixel dimensions. So you basically you need the length of the line to figure out what part is the dash part drawn and what part is the dash part not drawn. Um, again, we haven't figured out everything, so the uh, kind of Little secret tip is if you hover over dash, um, we'll show you the length right there. Um, so I want a better way to do this in the future, but this is the way to do it right now. So um, when you get this in your hands, you can play with it. Um, so in this, it says the length is 446. Um, so all I need to do is enter this in. I'll just round up to 447. And I set the offset to 447, so now it's gone. I can make an animation and just animate that offset to zero. Now you have the line drawn like that. And that'll of course work um, when you edit the line. You can do anything. You can do a line like that. Of course now the length of the line has in fact changed, um, so you need to get a new length. So 535. And 
And so now you can fill out a curved line. And there were a few techniques you could have done in the past to kind of simulate this, but this is going to be a lot more accurate than any of those techniques were. And it looks like now the guy has like floss hanging from his mouth, <laughs> but that's okay. So like I said, part of the theme for this is it's a hype element and it integrates with all the other hype features. So let me draw another shape. Um, it'll be like a little bit of a clip. I'm just gonna copy and paste a couple of these. And I'm gonna make the document a little bit bigger. And you'll see why in a moment. I, I know I'm doing this in the dark, but Trust me on this one. Okay, so we have a few objects like that. Um, I'm gonna make one more path at the bottom. Okay, like I said, any um, basic hype constructs, including physics. So I'm going to make these dynamic bodies so they'll fall. Um, I'm gonna change the color because I like doing that. And this bottom part here, I'm going to make a static body, so that's going to be our floor. I'm going to give these a little bit more of a bounce and a little bit less friction. Um, and now when I animate, they fall and interact as you would expect. Um, so you can make pretty much arbitrary shapes and have them interact with physics. So oh, the fun we will have. <laughs> uh, one more time, because uh, I like watching the physics. And so that's shapes, and those are the eight new features of Hype 4.0.